All right, well, we're, we're ready to start. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having us here. Today, we're going to be talking about how and why eliminating the gap between development and production is important and how you can use Kubernetes and Crossplane to get us started on this. Um, so my name is Ramiro Berreyesa. I am a CEO and co-founder of Octeto. We're a company that builds software for automating the developer experience of your entire organization. Um, I am Ash. I am a developer experience engineer at Octeto. I come from India, and I'm also a CNCF ambassador. And we are really excited to talk about this topic, which is very close to our hearts, and we have spent a lot of time you know, thinking about this and talking to multiple people. So let's just start. Uh, before we go into dev experience and all of that, I just want to set the stage and talk a bit about like why are we having this conversation now? Like what has changed for us that we want to talk about this? The thing is that before we came to this world of microservices, we were all like all the applications were monoliths and we were building monoliths and sure monoliths are not scalable and they have their whole set of problems, but I think it is safe to say, like, as an individual developer working on a monolith, the experience was a lot more simpler than what we are seeing with microservices, right? Because if everything is like one huge thing, like it is huge, I am not taking the size of monoliths here, but getting the thing up and running is easy, like developing on it is easy. But when you come to microservices, there are so many pieces, there are so many individual parts that assembling them together during development, seeing how one part affects the other, that all thing complicates the development process and you know tends to lead to a bad development experience if you don't invest into tools which help fix that. Next slide. So the golden rule which we have like always agreed on is that development should mirror production, right? That is how you minimize bugs, by developing in an environment which is exactly like the production setup you have. And with monoliths, this was easy, like, because like, your monolith would run in a VM somewhere, which was not that different from running the entire thing on your local machine. But when microservices started to come into picture and containers, how we run them locally is very different from how we started running them on Kubernetes and pods. So what did we do to like fix this? We either like started to just work on individual microservices locally. So let's say if you're working on a full stack application, so you would just bring up the front end, work on that, and like maybe bring up the back end if you want to see the entire thing. But that is what started complicating this. So a couple of solutions we put in place to fix this, and we can see them on the next slide. First was like we built better CI CD, right? We ensured that like when you're developing to ensure that your code will work in production, we build pipelines. So you write code, you commit it, you push it to the pipeline, CI does its thing, and it gives you the feedback. If it's green, you know your code is working. And this is a very effective way of knowing that your changes will not break production. But what is a problem here is that it is very far away from the developer. The feedback is not instant, right? You, you can't just like write a line of code, hit save, and you know, know that this thing will work in production. You have to commit your changes. You have to wait for CI to do its thing. And Ramiro, do you want to talk about what the problem with staging we have seen? Yeah, of course. So once, once we had C CI, CD, uh, one of the next evolutions we saw is to having this fixed number of environments available where you can test things end to end. I've worked for very large companies before Octeto where we had this, where you had a few staging environments. And you can call them staging, test, pre-production, uh, integration, use this as a wildcard for that environment where you have all your application running end to end. Typically, it's only a few. And then you're going to see some patterns emerging where, because it's the only place where you can really validate that your changes are not going to break production, you normally have like a queue of developers waiting for access to this environment. They run their stuff, they leave it kind of halfway running. If they find something, they have to go back all the way to the beginning of the CI CDQ. But in a lot of places, it's very valuable because this is the environment that gives you the certainty that your changes are going to work. So it's great from that perspective, gives you validation, helps you have certainty and not break production. However, the challenge is they're, that, they're not that many. It's not very efficient because you're always waiting for it to be available. At, at this company's work for, we even ended up creating like a bot on Slack to reserve time 
on the environment because it was such a contentious thing. And it's not a great way to work. It's not very effective. And you always end up spending a lot of time fixing these environments because typically somebody puts their changes, they break something, they're like, okay, I'm done. I need to work on this more. Somebody else is your turn. And then you SSH to the environment and okay, something's broken. You have to like relaunch it, fix it, and then get ready to work. So again, it's, it is self-service, it's helpful, but it's not, not ideal. Not ideal for developers, for sure. Like, and same thing with we put like Minikube into like which try to replicate Kubernetes on your local desktop. Again, the fact of the matter is that it is a replication. It is not the actual thing you use in production, and they take a lot of resources too, right? If you're trying to run a complex workload on your Minikube or Kind cluster, you need to have the fanciest of MacBooks to make sure you can still Slack and Zoom your coworkers. So these are some attempts, and next slide. We are going to now talk about like two golden rules which we you know, came up with in our discussions talking about development experience. And Ramiro, can you take the first one? Yeah, of course. So one of the biggest benefits of, of us working at a, at a company that builds developer tools is we spend a lot of time talking about developer experience with, uh, with prospects, with users, with community. A few of you in the audience, you, we've had this conversation before of what is the experience you want to build and why. And after you know, multiple years and talking to like hundreds, if not thousands of companies, there are two things we've seen that are like key for a high-performing organization that ha kind of has less of the issues we've been talking about. First one is you need to make sure that your developers are self-sufficient. Uh, self-hosting, self-service, self-service is very important. You don't want to have developers waiting around for environments to be available so they can be effective. This is a time sink we've seen in a lot of like old school companies. But also, you want to make sure that they are self-sufficient but without having this constant context switch. Context switch kills productivity. If you have to like, the self-service, but you have to like build a queue cluster from scratch every time, go to your AWS account and provision all these things by hand, that is taking away you know, brain cycles from actually solving the problem that your team or your company is meant to. So that is something we have to be very careful about, like keeping the context switch to the minimum, making sure developers are self-sufficient so they can be effective. The second rule is that the dev environments need to be fast, ephemeral, and like production. And each of these uh, words has an importance here. You need these environments to spin up quickly, like we talked about staging environments. They should not be like a queue or waiting or any sort of delay in getting access to these dev environments because that kills productivity. Ephemeral, why? Because that is how like you do not want to you know uh, carry on the load of experimenting you did on a previous cluster environment to continue to the next one. You want sp to spin up things like as in so that you can iterate faster and you can experiment with things. And that is why you need an environment which is ephemeral. You can delete things easily. You can start from scratch. You can let your imagination go wild. And the last part is very important, which is making it look like production. And that has been one of the hardest challenges as we like continue to grow into this world of cloud native because the production landscape is like evolving continuously, right? Replicating Kubernetes during development has been problematic. So now that you know these two problems, we want to get into the demo. And for this demo, we'll do a bit of role play. And we are going to be ro role playing as two people we saw most commonly in the companies and organizations we have talked to. I'm going to be developer David. Now developer De David could be like a full stack engineer working on front end, back end, anything. But Developer David cares about building cool stuff. I want to build the product. I want to fix bug fixes. I want to ship value and do all of that cool stuff. Ramiro, what are you going to be playing? I'm going to be playing Cindy Lopez, which is a platform engineer. It's, it's a play on Cindy Lopez, for those of you not born in the 80s like me. <laughs> and and uh, my goal is you know, I want to create automation. I want to be bugged. I want to be effective. I want to focus my time on like, in, uh, integrating cool stuff, enabling everybody else. And most of everything, I want to enable my team to be self-service because I want them to be efficient. But more importantly, I want them to leave me alone to do my own things. OK, um, so I'm developer David, and I work at a very famous taco shop. We have a website, which is very fancy. And we recently switched from a monolith architecture to multiple microservices. 
So, Cindy, can you help me get started with developing? Uh, okay, I guess. Uh, what do you need to get started with developing? Uh, well, I've been told we are using S3 buckets and SQS queues in production, so can you create them for me? Do I need to open up a Jira ticket? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, first of all, you need to use your Teams account. You can't just be creating resources everywhere. And when you create these resources, you have to make sure they have the right tags, they have the right uh, versions, you're using the right naming scheme, and that you deploy them on the right region, region? for you. What is region like? We are in Tel Aviv, so do I choose like AWS Tel Aviv or something? Uh, uh, yeah, if only, but maybe next year, but no, 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 no. Uh, uh, okay, okay, this is a lot for you. Clearly, this is not, on, this is not what you should be focusing on. Um, um, let's automate this, but is it something you need once, or is it like a multiple No, so things? like, what are you talking about? Like every time I want to develop, I need the bucket and the queue up and running, and like, I assume to save your job, you'll ask me to close them also. So I don't want to do all of these things. What I can do is open a Jira ticket to create these resources and want to let you know when to close them. So uh, it's your job. No, yeah, I don't want you to open like 300 Jira tickets every day. I, no, that's not gonna work. I love Jira, why do you hate Jira? I don't hate Jira, I just hate all those emails every single day. So, you know what? But here's, here's you know, we're in a Q conference, and there's this great project called Crossplane. It's part of the CNCF landscape. I think that's gonna, um, it's gonna help us here today. So, first of all, uh, let's start with abstractions. You said that you need... An S3 bucket and an NQ. Perfect, okay, well, let's start there. So, Crossplane has this beautiful concept called composition where we can put all these things together. A composition, let me show you this beautiful YAML I put together magically just right now, uh, with the infrastructure that you need for this Taco Shop software. You mentioned you need an S3 bucket, which is here. Uh, as I said, I wanna limit the region, the name, I can do that all in, in Crossplane. And also, as you ask, an SQ, SQSQ, which also it's only available today on EU and US uh, region. So the composition is how I tell Crossplane to create the resources you need as a unit. I don't want you to think in terms of like S3, SQS. No, you need the infrastructure for your application. So this is something we can create. I will recreate this in our cluster. So it's available to everybody that wants to use this infrastructure. You and everybody else on your team. You're going to tell them, do not open Jira tickets, use the compositions, and use Crossplane. So first step, composition. This is for me as a platform. Here's where I control which resources, which size, which parameters I want to expose to my developers, and all that sweet stuff. I don't want developers to have to be experts on every single uh, AWS, GCP, um, DigitalOcean service. I want them to be experts on the Taco Shop software they're building. So the step one is we have a composition. <laughs> step two is we have the composite resource definition. This is the equivalent of a CRD. CRD. Uh, it uses the same format, uh, uses this open API to define the API. And what we do here is I'm going to give it a friendly name. And here's what I tell Crossplane which resources, which options of the resources that I define on my composition, I'm going to make available to the users of this. Here's what I have full control. Do you want to export everything and give them? The ability to deploy on every single region, every single size, every Which single is version. It's not a good idea. No, it's not. I'm glad, I'm glad you're learning. It's not a good idea. Uh, so in this case, just for demo purposes, the only property I'm exposing is the region. Because it matters, right? Uh, it matters if you're, if you're a developer running in the US, you don't want to pay the latency ta ta um, tax. If you are somewhere else, well, you pick whatever is closest to you. Uh, I could even not have this and say, you know what? No, the company is standardized on the Frankfurt region for everybody, because it's like the easiest, cheapest, whatever reason you might have. It could be a, even a physical location. Crossplane works, has this beautiful provider model, and it works with all cloud providers, bare metal, and anything else you want. So that now that I have my composition and my composite resource definition, I'm gonna give it a name. And Crossplane has this other concept called claim. Claim, the same way that a resource claim in the previous talk by NVIDIA, or a volume claim, is how the end user, in this case, developer David, asks for this infrastructure. And in your case, developer David, this is what you're gonna have to give me. Blah, blah, blah. So this is what I actually care about, right? One YAML file for me. 
I just have to apply this? Exactly. So let me, let me show it to you live. I have a terminal here for my cluster. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a namespace for you. Because I want everybody to have their own namespace. Um, we're going to call it dev, because that, that is his first name. His first name is developer. It's yeah, just, I made my job my life. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> and, and once we have that, uh, and it, will the Wi-Fi play well with us today? Well, the good thing is I pre-created everything, so we'll go with it. The next thing you're going to do is just create that claim. And one of my favorite things about cross-plane is it allows you to use the Kubernetes mechanisms to create these resources. So in this case, all you have to do is kubectl apply bash f, the claim that you created. In this case, we're going to use a dev namespace. And we're going to click enter. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to switch to my phone's um, work or somebody else's. And this is the command like I care about like as a developer, just applying that claim. I don't need to know. like if it's an S3 bucket or it's in Q and where, what the region is, I get provided this claim and I can just change the configuration values there, apply it, and have my infrastructure created. Exactly, exactly. So when, when this command executes, uh, and you know you need network for that, uh, what's going to happen then is Crossplane will eventually create, it has like this conciliation loop, it will create those resources for you on Kubernetes. So if we go here. Is, the, is it connected to the net now? I think so. Otherwise, uh, you can connect to my hotspot. Let's try this command. It is connected, right? Let's do something. Let's turn off. Just to prove that we're doing a live demo. And there we go. Yeah, I don't think yours is. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Now we have connection. So you can see that now here, I created my claim. And the claim is called my DV. And it's synced with, with the provider, and it's ready. In this case, we're not, not exposing any secrets. But you could configure Crossplane to expose the URI, create keys on demand, all that stuff. It's, it's fairly simple. And now, just to show you that things are actually get created, Crossplane exposes the AWS, GCP, any of these uh, spaces on an API, kubectl get queues. And this will query. It will go query our AWS account. And it's going to show you that there are a few queues created. In this case, there's one queue that developer David created, and there's another queue that Cindy created while I was developing all this, all this integration. So here, you, know, you now know how to create a claim. You know how to create uh, your, record, your resources. So why are you still here? Uh, is anything else? More data tickets? Of course there's more stuff. What about the three million microservices the application is made up of? Like, how do I get them up and running on a cluster? And you've created these resources for me, but I still don't know how they connect to my application, right? Uh, wow. So, so you really just want to focus on code, right? Like, do you even Kubernetes, bro? What? <laughs> Kubernetes what? Uh, never mind. You know what? Let's just automate ourselves away from this. You're right. You should not have to be an expert on Kubernetes and all these other things. Um, Thank you. Finally, someone said that. <laughs> So now that you have your infrastructure, let's talk about your application. What I'm going to show you now is there's this new breed of, of tools that I like to call developer experience automation that allow you to automate what your dev environment looks like and deploy it with one command so that everybody can just run one command and run your, your infrastructure, as I show you, and your code without you having to be an expert on this. So there's many of them, all of them open source today. Because I am a maintainer of this one, I'll show you this one real quick called Octeto. Uh, the general, general concept with all of these tools is you want to put in code all the development environment. So you want to have, in this case, your build command, your deploy command, and then when you're ready to develop the things you need there. In case of Octero, file synchronization environments, you could be using others like Scaffold, like DevPod. There's a bunch of those. But the key here is that it's all automated. You don't want to have to run every single thing manually. You see here, for instance, this application requires a secret to be created on the namespace, and then three different Helm upgrade commands to deploy your three microservices. Not three million. Let's not get overly excited here. Three services. And, and what happens here is that now that you have your file, we're just going to call command up. 
and up will go through this list of, of commands. It will build whatever needs to be built. It will deploy. You can see here it's going to create the secret. And everything is happening on Kubernetes. Nothing an should be running cluster. on your local machine. Yeah, this is not like Minikube kind of anything. This is an actual Kubernetes cluster where this gets deployed to. And the idea is that the manifests you mention in the deploy section are the same manifests that Cindy uses when they deploy the application to production. So this is how, when we talk about like bridging the gap, it is very essential that you use the same configuration, same manifest you use for production. You use them in development as well. And that is how you can you know, shift left things and ensure that you catch on any bugs, any breaches, security things early on. And the best part of this is that everything is running on, 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 on our shared Kubernetes cluster, which means that you don't have to be an expert on the entire CNCF landscape to be able to take advantage of all these amazing open source tools that the community has been building. What's the landscape? Is it a place in Tel Aviv I can visit? Uh, no, let's, let's go back to the demo. Um, so you see here, it's almost done. And once this is up and running, you're going to have a copy of your own environment on Kubernetes, fully integrated with the services, with the cloud resources, with Crossplane, and all those beautiful things. And let me just show you. And there you go. The full application running. You can now go try it out, fix any bugs, cost more bugs probably, but not on me. And now every Jira ticket that you open will be for your team. Well, thank you, Cindy. I think I've started to like you a little bit better now. <laughs> so this was it for our demo. And we hope you found this useful. But just to give you a little recap of the things we discussed and the tools we talk about. The first thing is Crossplane, which transforms your Kubernetes cluster into a universal control plane. And what we showed you was just a part of what Crossplane can do for your workflow. We saw how it abstracted the S3 bucket and the queue for us. But Crossplane is actually a control plane. So it has the whole reconciliation loop thing Kubernetes does. So it actually checks for your resources if they are healthy or not. And if they are not, it will you know, try to bring them up again. So try uh, Crossplane out. And we'll see that we saw that what Crossplane you know, does for Cindy and how it allows Cindy to create these abstractions on top of be it Kubernetes, be it non-Kubernetes resources, living anywhere, and they get abstracted out. And for me, developer David, it just you know simplifies things. It gives me a one simple YAML. I can add all the fields which are relevant to me and apply that YAML. And everything I need, be it living in whatever cloud provider or anywhere else, gets created for me. And, and something important to add here is when we talk about abstraction, it's not just about automating the creation of resources, which is very important, but you're also automating governance, compliance, control, uh, cost, anything you need to automate, like, you know, depending on every human in your organization who have to type manually a command every time they create a resource, it's not realistic. Like, Crossplane makes it a lot easier for all of us to just codify that. You put it, as you saw, on a YAML file. You're going to put that on a repo under source control where it's going to be visible, auditable, and then everybody in your organization can just benefit from that, centralized, rather than doing it team per team or individual per individual. And, and here's a We saw how Crossplane worked. Like There's the side which I, as developer David, care about, which is just the claim. And then there's the side which Cindy set up for me. And that had like a composite resource. Composite resource is what had like our S3 bucket and our queue. And we saw that composite resources are made up of compositions and composition resource definitions, which is where you define you know, what fields developer David can configure, and which is where you, you know, set up the integration between this schema you have created for your composite resource and the actual resources in the cloud provider. And we looked at Kubernetes development environments and what they you know, do and how they help you bring all the microservices to an actual cluster so you can get right to development. And for Cindy, they make sure that you know, Cindy does not have to spin up a cluster each time for developers. And they can just, you know, it, this whole idea, I feel, of 
a manifest as a dev environment is very powerful as we you know navigate through these times where we are switching from monoliths to microservices because it, it ensures that things remain ephemeral and it ensures that everyone can you know just clone the repository and run a single command and get right to development and and by having it defined and running on kubernetes it means that you can start getting closer to using the same configuration infra tooling that you have in production like you have to make a call of how close you want it to be but there's definitely a lot of value in giving access to developers to these tools earlier in the cycle because as we all know the sooner you find integration issues the sooner you find issues around policy around compliance around airbag all these things the easier they are to fix like you don't want to find once you're ready to hit production that oh yeah my code doesn't work at kubernetes because everything is running on local host or i'm using a i don't know a javascript library that my team doesn't want me to use because it has not been vetted by our DevSecOps teams. All those things are like, are like very important from a productivity perspective, from a security perspective, and also from a reduction of annoyance. So I like to call it perspective for developers. Yeah. So, uh, and there are a lot of tools which help you do this. Like uh, there's DevPod, there's Telepresence, there's Octeto CLI, which we saw. So you have a lot of open source options to choose from and they all try to achieve a similar uh, goal, only they differ in their approaches. So you can see what works best for you. And that was it. I hope you found this talk useful. If you did, uh, go check out the projects. This uh, The code for the application we showed would be live. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter. And I think we have like two and a half minutes for Q&A. Thank you. OK, time. Time for questions. Who has a question? With a raise of hands, I see a question there at the back. Just a second. Here you go. Thank you. Uh, you said you have 3 million services, and we have 20 developers. Most of them use uh, the same 99% of the services, but each one needs to develop just one. Do you duplicate the environment for each one of them? It could be very costly. And second question, what about shared resources? We have huge database and traffic that everyone wants to use, each one in his own environment, but the same one. So how do you do it? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can do any of these models. We, we've seen this on, on the field with like members of our community, where the, it depends on how your team is interacting. We, we believe that full application per developer makes a lot of sense. Uh, as we all know, Kubernetes is really good at running infra at scale. It's surprisingly cheaper once you put everything together. Uh, but that's not the only way. Like you could have a way we've seen where you can have a staging environment with like all your services, and then every developer only deploys the environments, uh, the services they care about, and then you can do things with Istio to do like like traffic management or just by using service discovery. It's a way. Same thing happens with shared resources. Yeah, I would recommend, as as Arch said earlier, speed is very important. If you have to wait 25 minutes for the environment to up and be up and running, nobody's gonna use it. Like for me, my tolerance after one or two minutes, like, okay, I'm done with this, I wanna do something else. So that's where like shared resources, like big databases are better shared. And then anything you can move to like a container based kind of fast start model. And here's where, as, as you think of the dev experience you wanna offer to your team, this is where you have to start making some hard choices of like, what do you value more? Speed, high fidelity, uh, are you okay with spending more resources? Like everything dev experience, you have to think of like what do, does your developers value more? What do they need? But tooling, the tooling we show you today works in all of these models. And uh, to add, add to that, like um, this is for development. So a lot of people get confused that you know, like this is at the scale of production. But when you deploy your dev, dev environment, you are not expecting like a huge traffic, right? It's just you and your team. So you do not actually end up running a large amount of pod so it is not that costly as it like you know seems running kubernetes for development and each developer can you know choose a namespace in the same cluster so it does not have to be one cluster per developer or something like that thank you very much let's take one more question here you go yeah, hello uh, so i described this as a tool to lift up uh, developer environments is there any reason not to use this also for production environments uh, well, the, for us, um, I'm going to speak from like when we, for our, our open source projects, um, we're focused on the developer experience and ergonomics. We feel like ephemeral environments is something that makes sense for, for dev, staging, test, integration. Production, in my opinion, has special needs, you know, like 
is long running, migrations, um, progressive rollouts, feature flags, all these things are, are tend to be more for production. So this, this CLI that we show you today are more focused on the ergonomics for dev. You could mix them. I prefer best of class for every stage, but it's definitely something that as, as these tools evolve, we always get that question, like where do you stop the experience and where do you start production? For me, that's a good line, but uh, again, it really depends on your tolerance for like which features do you need and, and how advanced you are in terms of like production rollouts as well. Last question, anyone? There's somebody in the back. Someone in the back, okay, let's run, let's run, let's run. <laughs> And while doing that, I remind everyone, please rank. This was an excellent talk. Please rank them on sked.com, the platform, the scheduling platform, this and all the rest of the talks. Remember to uh, give the feedback to the uh, speakers. And here we go. Last question. Uh, first of all, thank you for a great presentation. Uh, my question is about complexity and cross-plane. So deploying an S3 bucket is awesome. It's simplifying layer. <laughs> But uh, how do you do? How do would you deploy with cross-plane complex infrastructure? Like you, you talked about S3 plus SNS, drop their database into that, and I want that to be dynamic. In some cases, I don't want SNS. In some cases, you got it. How? What is your suggestion? Yeah, that's that's what really cross-plane shines. That is what the whole composition model is about. Uh, I show something simple today because I want it to be like fast and easy to, to grasp. But actually, database is one of the most popular things that Crossplane offers because as, as if you ever deployed an RDS database, you know that how many parameters are there to set up, security groups, database security groups. So Crossplane allows you to express all this in YAML. And, and that's what for me makes it easier. The fact that it's YAML also means that you can combine this with things that like customize. If you want to do more dynamic, like create this or create that. What I recommend. Uh, based on my experience here, is create your compositions of your building blocks. You can compose compositions. You can create packages. Um, Crossplane has a very robust model of like these types. And that way, you put together these offerings. And that way, when your developers create a claim, they can pick. Oh, I need you know, the, the typical demo, right? I need like a very large database with multi-AC replication and a backup from like last week. You can model that on, on Crossplane. You can make that available to your developers. And you can have like the light database on a container very fast that you could also model in Crossplane in order to have like uniformity. That's how I recommend going out of these things, create those, those bugs. But there's a very large community. There's a Slack I recommend you join uh, for Crossplane. Commun I think it's community.crossplane.com. But just search for, for Crossplane and Slack. And there's a lot of experts there that can help you architect and, and figure out the right level of composition that you need. Uh, but I'm happy to talk more. Uh, we're going to be here for the rest of the event and at the, at the happy hour. So thank you very much. I hope this was useful. Thank you very much, Austin Ramiro. Great, great talk.